Well, thank you, uh, Stephanie, and, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us today. Uh, as Stephanie said, I'm Chris Ballard. I'm the CEO of, of Passive House Canada, uh, and I'm so pleased to see so many of you uh, joining us uh, today for this edition of Building Conversations. Um, and it's uh, it is a, an interesting. We have a we have a great guest. We'll have an interesting conversation. So, without further ado, uh, I will turn my camera off, and we'll uh, get the show on the road. June is Embodied Carbon Month here at Building Conversation. Uh, and as high performance buildings become the norm, operational carbon will be reduced, but we must not forget embodied carbon. And Chris Magwood, our guest today, will be talking to us a lot about uh, embodied carbon and operational carbon and how those two are combined. Um, we can't wait for operational carbon to be dealt with uh, to begin addressing embodied carbon. And uh, while PHI, Passive House Institute, is agnostic when it comes to building materials for now anyway, um, and embodied carbon is really not part of PHI standards, uh, Passive House Canada is exploring how it can educate uh, the Canadian design industry and support the use of, of low carbon building materials. Uh, and we'll, uh, we will be incorporating discussions about embodied carbon in building conversations this month. So thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to our conversation. So a little bit about me. I've had a variety of, uh, of jobs over the past few years. Uh, one of the more fun ones I had was as a municipal councillor, but I have been a, a business owner. I've led a consumer advocacy organization. I've been a journalist and I have been uh, uh, a minister of environment and climate change. So a wide variety that uh, uh, has led me right to the passive house door because uh, uh, when I've investigated passive house standards, I became convinced that uh, this is the way for new and retrofit buildings. Uh, it has many of the answers for our uh, many environmental and building challenges and embodied carbon uh, is uh, next on the list. So Passive House is a membership-based not-for-profit. It's an advocacy organization. We spend a lot of time talking to governments and businesses about uh, very high performance uh, homes and buildings. We do a lot of education, a lot of capacity development. We run national events. Uh, we offer our members uh, technical services. We have about 13 staff in three cities and at least 15 instructors now. I think we might have a few more. Um, one of the things that has struck me about Passive House is that um, uh, as I've got to know people within the organization and membership, this is a group of people who do things. They're more than talk. They design, they build, uh, they get their hands dirty. Uh, in the construction world. So when they speak about a topic, it's from a position of experience. Uh, it's not just theory. So very interesting group of people that I've had the privilege of, uh, of working with. Our guest today is Chris Magwood. Uh, Chris is obsessed with making the best, most energy efficient, beautiful and inspiring buildings without wrecking the whole darn planet in the attempt. Now that's a Direct quote from his, uh, from his website. He is currently the executive director at the Endeavor Center in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, he's a sustainable building designer. He's a writer and researcher, uh, and he shares his research and uh, development and practical experience in books, videos, blogs, and public speaking. Passive House Canada has had the pleasure of, uh, of having Chris at a couple of our events to, uh, to talk to the crowd. So, um, Chris has more than 15 years of, of teaching people how to design sustainably. Uh, and uh, he's uh, written a number of books, uh, Essential Sustainable Home Design, Essential Prefab Straw Bale Construction, Essential uh, Hempcrete Construction, Making Better Buildings, More Straw Bale Buildings. So a very accomplished researcher, designer, uh, and teacher. So lots to learn from Chris today as we uh, get into our conversation. But first, and for those who uh, are joining us for the first time uh, on today's show, 
I like to talk a little bit about passive house and passive house standards. And I like to remind people that, that passive house building standards are not foreign to Canada. They're not some European import. They actually have their history and a lot of their ancestry right here in Canada with the Saskatchewan Conservation House. Back in, uh, 19, in the 1970s, the government of Saskatchewan funded a group of scientists to build and develop uh, or develop and build a, a, a home that could be um, sustainable in the face of uh, initial OPEC oil embargo embargoes that had rattled uh, our governments uh, who were worried about how do we stay warm in, in the wintertime. Uh, this Saskatchewan Conservation House is a direct result of that. A lot of research by uh, a physicist by the name of Dr. Orr and his co-workers. The building is still lived in today. It's still operating to the same high standards, high performance standards uh, as when it was built. And it's been acknowledged by the Passive House Institute as being one of the uh, one of the ancestors of the modern Passive House building standards. So. As a Canadian, I'm quite proud of the fact that uh, what Passive House Canada is talking about today uh, really has its roots in what was happening in Saskatchewan back in the 1970s. So again, for those of you who are new to Passive House uh, building, there are five principles of Passive House design. The first is that you have to have super insulation, so well insulated walls. Uh, and ceilings and foundations. The second is that uh, the construction has to be airtight, as airtight as possible. Uh, and we can, uh, we can prove uh, how airtight your building is by using a, a, a blower door, doing a blower door test. The next is that uh, it has to be thermal bridge free. So we have to keep uh, the warmth in and the cold out in the winter time and vice versa in the summer. Uh, you have to have high quality windows with solar orientation. So triple pane windows uh, with, uh, with a, an inert gas between them all uh, with some type of uh, e-coating um, and positioned in such a way that the, the hot sun of the summertime doesn't warm the interior. But in the wintertime, we want that sun to come in and warm our house. And that's why we're passive. And the fifth principle is that you need a ventilation system with heat recovery. So passive houses are known for their healthy air because we do bring in lots of fresh air and it is warmed by the outgoing exhaust air. Uh, and people who live in work uh, or go to school in passive house buildings uh, talk about how quiet, how comfortable and how good the air is when they're in those buildings. So moving along, let's begin uh, a conversation with Chris. And uh, Chris, at this time, I will invite you to turn on your camera and uh, and join me in a, in a conversation. And and thanks again for uh, uh, for agreeing to uh, uh, to be on our show today. So maybe you can tell us a little bit to begin with, Chris, about the Endeavor Center. Sure. Yeah, we um, we're about to celebrate our tenth anniversary, and Great. we are sort of first and foremost a uh, a building school. So we offer uh, a range of different programs to help both professional builders and sort of homeowner builders um, to learn uh, both sort of theory and hands-on uh, how to make good, energy efficient, uh, ecologically responsible, and healthy buildings. Right. And our, our core course uh, is one where we actually build a complete building from start to finish with the group of students. So it usually uh, runs from about four to six months long, full time. And the, the cohort uh, literally you know, sees that building project develop from the, the ground to final finishes. Excellent. Excellent. And, it's, and, 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 and I'll encourage anyone to, uh, to uh, check out uh, the website for the Endeavor uh, Center and uh, look at some of the projects you've been involved with. Um, quite fantastic. So, so thanks for that. Um, we can uh, let me just uh, move back to our presentation here. And 
So in talking about, uh, about uh, the importance of uh, embodied carbon, um, I know that uh, I'm really interested to, to learn from you, and maybe you can talk to us a bit about the importance of, of carbon storage in building materials. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, and I think you would agree that, that, that it's either not considered or it's misunderstood. Um, so I, I'd really appreciate taking some time to talk about, uh, about how it works and, and what it means. So talk to us about the importance of carbon storage in building materials. Sure, yeah. Um, and I, you know, as part of that, the, I guess understanding what we mean by embodied carbon in the first place, because it's, uh, it's sort of an unfortunate term um, because most people who are talking about embodied carbon are not actually talking about carbon that is embodied in a material. Right. Um, that the, the term comes from, uh, you know, as, as people started to research that the energy that goes, that went into making building materials, the right. term embodied energy kind of, you know, was coined to describe, you know, if you've got this sheet of drywall, how much energy went into making that drywall. And in that case, the term embodied sort of made sense because that energy was used to make that product. When researchers started to look into the, the sort of carbon results of that energy use, the term just got sort of transferred to carbon. It went from embodied energy to embodied carbon. But we're right. not actually talking about carbon that's embodied in materials most of the time. No, um, but we will also talk about that. But but what what most you know what the term embodied carbon has sort of come to mean is what are the emissions that have resulted from the manufacturing and harvesting and installation of of building materials. Right. Okay. So, and most materials only have emissions associated with them. So um, if you think about all the standard things that would would typically go into a home, uh, most of those materials really you know, the only uh, climate change result that comes from harvesting and making those materials is negative. The, you know, emissions are generated by digging in the ground to get rocks out of the ground, by heating those rocks up in a kiln. You know, there's a, a whole bunch of things that happen uh, along the supply chain that cause emissions. Right. Carbon storing materials are basically the, the, the plant-based materials that we would use in a building. So, um, you know, wood and lumber products is the, you know, the main thing we do, but also things like cellulose insulation, wood fiber insulation, um, and then the less common things that, you know, we, we like to use a lot at Endeavor, like straw and hemp and cork and, you know, all those other kind of biofibers. Mm -hmm. Those materials, while they've been growing, have been taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Right. And essentially splitting that CO2 the oxygen goes back out into the atmosphere so we can breathe, which is a wonderful little byproduct. <laughs> and the carbon stays in the plant as the, as the body of the plant. And so most plant-based materials are sort of between 35 and 50% carbon by weight. And that carbon was in the atmosphere and is now in the plant. Right. So when we're talking about carbon storing building materials, what we're saying is that material actually provided a carbon drawdown while it was growing and in the normal carbon cycle would have just been released back to the atmosphere. So um, a tree would fall down, it would rot, the carbon in it would go back to the atmosphere. Um, a straw crop would you know, be harvested and either burnt or left to molder and the carbon goes back to the atmosphere. By incorporating those materials into a building, we're essentially interrupting that carbon cycle right. and putting that carbon locking it into the building for you know at least the the length of time that that building exists mm -hmm. so that it's actually providing a a carbon drawdown a sort of if you have a ledger sheet going of the emissions your building has caused and right. and the 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 uh drawdown that it's performed the 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 carbon storing materials are sort of the the minuses on that balance sheet right okay and so that would be uh, more of the true essence of 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 embodied carbon then so uh, carbon that's that's captured uh, and stored uh, in a product that then is incorporated into a building 
and as long as that building is standing and then hopefully through some recycling and reusing uh, after the building has uh, met its useful life, uh, uh, that, that carbon remains um, embedded or em embodied within that product. Is, is that what we're talking about? Because you're right, uh, it does get confusing uh, about uh, carbon capture, carbon footprint, uh, embodied carbon. It does, yeah. I, I kind of like to replace the term embodied carbon as it's typically used with material emissions. To me, that speaks more clearly to the fact that emissions were generated in, you know, in the process of making those materials. Um, and then some of those materials are carbon storing. So that's that's the terminology that uh, that I'm starting to use. Right. OK, that helps clarify that. Now, the slide I have up. Uh, is the uh, Builders for Climate Action, a publication that, uh, uh, that you wrote, uh, uh, low building, uh, low rise buildings as a climate change solution that was published uh, uh, just last year. Um, I've got a few slides from that, uh, that book, Chris. I'm not, uh, maybe we can uh, move ahead. I'll click on the next slide and you can talk to us a little bit about, uh, uh, about what's happening here. So. Uh, this is, you know, we talk about, you were just talking about why materials matter. Explain what's happening in this slide. Sure, yeah. So what I did for this study, so I, I started getting really interested in embodied carbon um, for our own projects at Endeavor, um, right. you know, in the last decade as as kind of climate change became a, a, a main driver in what we were doing um, or one of the key considerations. I started to want to understand for for our own practice here what what were the climate effects of the the way that we were building what you know and looking at the materials and not just the operational emissions and so I started looking around at places for materials and it was pretty limited at that time mm -hmm. um, but I did find some information and I started to kind of do some really just back of the envelope calculations based on, on our building projects and was getting some really, some answers that I found really kind of baffling um, in that some of the answers I was getting had really huge numbers attached to them where I was like, really, you know, I'm causing that much climate change by, you know, using this particular material. And then on the other hand, for the plant-based materials, I was getting fairly these fairly large kind of negative minus answers, and I was like, "Really? Is this? You know, is am I is, am I doing something wrong here?" Um, mm -hmm. And so, after you know a bunch of research, I decided to to actually go back to school. So the the report we're looking at is uh, based on the the thesis that I did for the master's degree. Um, right. And what I did was I I basically took uh, a really typical single-family home plan. Um, and a typical small MERB. So the results we're looking at here are for the the, the multi-unit building, which is a four-story, eight-unit, 10,000 square foot building. I literally chose those plans by Googling most popular you know, MERB plan uh, in Canada and you know found this plan. And what I did was I assembled um, as many environmental product declarations, which are sort of a uh, an ISO standard third party right. verified you know uh, report card on uh, impacts from building materials, one of which is uh, the climate change global warming potential mm -hmm. and I, I I did material takeoffs for these buildings and associated their carbon footprint with the amount of material it would take to make this particular building and I did that with as many materials uh, as I could find data for. Um, and what I so what you're seeing here is the results of that. So if I if I chose materials that were from the high end of all the different options, um, and you can see you know some of the key ones there are listed. That's not all of them, but right, right. That that, that MERB could have you know 240 uh, kilograms per square meter of floor area of emissions associated with it, which meant that that whole building had over 200 tons of emissions before it was even occupied um, right. which is pretty <laughs> you know pretty huge and we'll see what that means when you look at the operational in one of the the other slides 
And then basically I swapped out those materials for ones that were um, less impactful, but still um, had an impact, but were kind of um, pretty easy one-to-one -one swaps and mm -hmm. got the number down to 90 kilograms per square meter. It's a pretty, then, it's a pretty, it's a pretty drastic drop, you know. When that's a huge drop. Like if, if any of us in the energy efficiency world could tweak a handful of materials and make that kind of impact, we would be patting ourselves on the back. Like that's, yeah. you know, that's yeah. more than that. It's more than halving the emissions um, just with some material swapping. And then the, the next one over the yellow one, that was if I picked what are all the best materials in terms of having low embodied carbon or, or carbon storage that are relatively widely available, that are code compliant, you know, that a builder could quite feasibly switch to. And mm -hmm. suddenly that same building has now dropped to having net storage of 11 kilograms per square meter. So it's, right. it's essentially a, a zero carbon footprint uh, building. Mm -hmm. And then the final model, that green one is, I modeled just what are the, all the best materials um, that I could use to make the best possible model. Um, and they all had to be things that have been used in code approved buildings in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily common, but they're not theoretical. They, they've all been done. And then you could get that same building down to that figure of 137 kilograms per square meter of net storage. So like this is, it's hard to get more skewed uh, results than that. You know, they, they really range the entire spectrum. Um, and so, and you know, at the end of the day, you're ending up with the same building. I mean, the same look and feel, maybe different, uh, different treatments in terms of cladding and, 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 and roofing, but in yeah. essence, same building. Yeah, like it's they're, they're all meeting the same performance level, which in this case is just Ontario code minimum. Um, mm -hmm. But I also modeled it as though it was meeting the the sort of upcoming net zero standards, and the numbers did um, change for that. But yeah, like for you know, as far as the occupants of this building would be concerned, they don't know the difference. Um, right, is just you know um, material swapping, and especially for that. The, 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 the one here that I found actually the most exciting, even though I love the result of the green one, yep. you know, I'm well aware that there's some way to go before, you know, everybody is building with compressed straw and, and all of these other materials that are in that building. But that yellow building, um, any builder doing low rise anywhere in North America today could start making that building tomorrow. You know, there's there's nothing complicated, difficult, expensive, unattainable, you know, that's a completely feasible building that takes you from, you know, having several hundred tons of carbon emissions associated to having none. And, having some storage, you know, yeah. That's, yeah, and, it's hard to imagine, you yeah. know, uh, being able to make a bigger difference than that so easily. And we, we, we sometimes hear, especially for folks who are new to the passive house building standard world, that uh, they haven't, they, they, would, they were worried about attempting a passive house because they didn't know where they could get the different components. Uh, and, uh, you know, outside of windows and doors, everything else can sort of be off the shelf, uh, we'll say. Um, but I'm looking at the yellow, I'm mean, looking at this and looking at all of the, uh, the components and those are readily available virtually anywhere in North America. So it, it's mm -hmm. not as if you've you've got to spend a lot of time sourcing uh, new or or different materials and and train up on how to use them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and one of the things you know, like what I don't want people to do is look at this slide and sort of see this as like <clears throat> prescriptive kind of materials or assemblies. It's yeah. you know for for people who understand the world of energy efficiency, you know, the, 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 the embodied carbon side, we can think of it the same way. Like you set a target, you know, I want this building to be no more than 50 kilograms of emissions per square meter. And then you go about meeting that and you, you think about the trade-offs for cost and complexity and availability in the same way that you might look at energy efficiency and say, well, I could either spend more on the these windows or put right. twice as much insulation in the attic and sometimes the answer is one and sometimes it's the other but you know these are these are targets that you set and then you go right. about sort of practically figuring out you know how to weigh it up so that you get there so right 
And I know there are folks in the passive house world who uh, uh, are using our design software. They've, uh, in fact, we're we're offering a course uh, in an add-on to the uh, to the software that allows you to take to have a good estimate of uh, of uh, that carbon use uh, in the buildings and select uh, uh, the uh, the best possible products you can for your project. But like you say, it's about you know, swapping out sometimes it's this or it's that uh, in order to make the project work. So I know people are aware of the issue. It's a matter of now uh, how we deal with it. So let me move on to uh, the next slide. Sure. And we're, we're looking at results with natural gas heating, uh, both combined upfront and operational carbon emissions. So Walk us through this slide, and I will say this report is attached to today's presentation, so uh, uh, folks who are watching in can have access to this uh, this full report and read it at their leisure. But walk yeah, us so, through, this slide, Chris. Yeah, there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack here, and it it, yeah. it's, um, it it might be a little bit confusing at first, but so what you're seeing here is the the gray line. The vertical line up and down the middle is sort of uh, the zero carbon line and everything to the left is emissions and everything to the right is carbon storage. And so if we start at the bottom, those two red bars, the 207 and the 236, that's the, the carbon emission in total um, uh, tons mm -hmm. of building that same MERB that we just looked at in the previous slide right. to either um, code minimum standard or increasing the insulation to get to the net zero standard. So it's not passive house, but it's um, tier five of you know what will become the, the national building code. So you can see that we we increase the the carbon footprint from the materials by making it more energy efficient. Uh, but then the yellow or the orangey bar to the to the left is showing that in code compliant form over 30 years you would have 300 tons of operating emissions to go with that. Right. Um, and the one above it, you've reduced that to 240. So, you know, you did cause more emissions uh, up front, but you saved them on the operational side. And so at the end of 30 years, the total carbon footprint of the building has gone down uh, a mm -hmm. little bit. Right. And then as we move up the graph, the blue one, is the next model of building. So you can see that um, you can see that you know our options here are either 109 tons of emissions for the code compliant one, or 128 for the uh, for the, the the net zero ready version. Because they're at the same level of energy efficiency, it's the same 300 tons of emissions from the operating, or it can be reduced to 240 by going to net zero. Mm -hmm. But you can see that the overall carbon footprint of the building is quite a bit lower than than the, the red version below but that's all due to the materials like the the op you haven't you know the operational uh, doesn't really change so as you as we sort of move up if we're starting at this sort of close to zero the minus 10 or minus 11 number mm -hmm. we still have the same 300 or 240 tons of emissions but at the end of 30 years you know that building um, has even less overall carbon footprint Right. And then when we start with a lot of carbon storing materials up in that top green version, because we're starting at a point of high carbon storage, at the end of 30 years, the emissions are less than the actual the actual emissions from the uh, from the operations because um, you've sort of offset it with a bunch of net storage. So, okay, uh, you know, a few things really pop out here, like how much the materials matter uh, for one. And that the 60 tons that you can reduce the emissions by jumping from Ontario code minimum to tier five net zero is 60 tons a year, which is great. We should absolutely be doing that. But mm -hmm. the jump between each of those typologies from the red building to the blue type, to the yellow, to the green is typically double that. So yeah. yes, we can definitely, and we absolutely need to, and should be making buildings more energy efficient, but we can eclipse the savings, the carbon savings of the energy efficiency by paying attention to the materials. The and material. if we do both, we get that result up at the top where you know, uh, a building has you know, less carbon footprint than the, than the fuel it's actually using. Amazing. I mean, uh, you know, coming from the passive house world, I get excited about marrying uh, 
uh, the uh, materials used in, in the yellow and the green at the top of this chart with uh, uh, passive house building standards to get the best of both worlds and, and really drive down uh, the carbon the carbon use intensity is uh, is the mm -hmm. terminology uh, that your report explains for us. Yeah, and I you know I sometimes uh, get into or or people have sort of uh, said you know accuse me of not you know or of saying that materials are more important than energy efficiency and I I absolutely don't want to be seen as saying that it's mm -hmm. just you know the planet only cares how much carbon goes into the atmosphere um, yeah. and so. It doesn't work for the planet if you, like on that red example, if you cause a whole bunch of emissions in the attempt to save emissions. Absolutely. It doesn't. It doesn't work for the planet. Like we need, like you said, it's it's a it's a yes and scenario where, you know, the materials matter and the energy efficiency matters. And if we really want to kind of turn the climate change situation around, we need to do our absolute best in both of those areas, um, because yeah. if we just single-mindedly focus on one or the other we may not be having the results that we had hoped we would. Absolutely. So um, I think for for a lot of us, uh, you know, we we uh, the discussion about uh, those upfront embodied carbon emissions uh, plus uh, operational carbon emissions gives us that carbon use intensity. And, and that carbon use intensity uh, is what uh, we all need to be thinking about as we design. Yeah. And we also have to think about, you know, with the there is a time value to when we reduce emissions and when we address it at the materials level, those are those are now emissions, you know, those are happening yeah. immediately those reductions. So, uh, you know, a ton saved today because of material choices is better than, you know, a tenth of a ton saved, you know, every year for the next 10 years because the ton that's in the atmosphere now keeps trapping heat in the atmosphere right. over those 10 years. So if you right. can, the more we can reduce now, it has a it has a bigger impact on on sort of the the overall warming of the climate than than scaling that out over the next yeah. 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Absolutely. So taking a tenth of a ton out over 10 years, not as important as taking one ton out today. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, another reason. But if we can I'm, do both, if we can do yeah. both, we should. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and and there's all sorts of other reasons why uh, operational carbon. If we can lower that, we can move to different sources of energy. As you're highlighting here with results from natural gas. Uh, I'll move to the next slide uh, that uh, talks about uh, the results with a heat pump uh, using uh, Ontario Electrical Grid uh, prices. Uh, and I know in Ontario that uh, our grid used to be 96% uh, carbon-free, we'll say, because of uh, uh, the use of hydroelectric, uh, nuclear, wind, and solar. So walk, yeah, us, and so walk us through this slide, Chris. Sure. So this slide is actually identical to the previous one in terms of the red, blue, yellow, and green bars. So those are still the same houses at the same level of energy efficiency with the same carbon footprint. And what's different is the little blue bar at the end has replaced the, the natural gas orange bar. And so you can see what used to be a 300 ton uh, emissions from the code compliant version is now down to 54 if we use, uh, this is modeled on an air source heat pump uh, right. using the Ontario grid kind of carbon average. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a, we can see that fuel switching is also a huge part of getting this overall carbon use intensity down. Right. Uh, so without any other improvements to the building, without making it more energy efficient, just the fuel switch makes a, a massive difference. And of course, that varies depending on where you are. You know, I ran this same study um, for the Nessie Group in Boston, and the heat pump result was almost the same as the natural gas result because their their grid there is currently, you know, so coal heavy that, that right. running an electric heat pump isn't really doing all that much for emissions, but at least they can change that. Whereas with 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 burning fossil fuels, you you can never lower the emissions that are going to come from that fossil fuel. Um, but here in Ontario, and I guess you know probably in BC, um, the results would look pretty similar. 
yeah, uh, BC, BC and Quebec and uh, exactly, Ontario. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But what's what starts to pop out here that's interesting, especially in these red and blue models, is that suddenly, if you're if you're getting your um, your energy from uh, a clean, a much cleaner source, here the high the high carbon footprint materials plus the energy uh, results in a higher carbon footprint than the code minimum building. So because as you save as you save energy, if that energy has less carbon emissions associated with it, it's not as impactful um, in terms of overall emissions. So again, this isn't saying that that we shouldn't be making buildings more energy efficient, but what it's saying is if we make them energy efficient, use clean energy, then the materials matter even more because here the more energy efficient building has the higher carbon footprint after 30 years um, and it takes uh, about uh, 120 years for it to catch up um, with the code compliant version so this is where you know as we make buildings better and as we start using clean energy now our material choices really matter because adding adding insulation that has a high carbon footprint can can actually you know, have the opposite effect that we think. We're actually raising the carbon footprint of the building. And the same thing happens here with this blue model, uh, although a little bit less, but the, the high performance version has a worse carbon footprint uh, than the code minimum version. But then when we get to the yellow and the, the green ones, the opposite happens because what's happening here is it's our insulation that's doing most of our carbon storage. So we've upped the insulation, which mm -hmm. ups our energy efficiency and ups our carbon storage. So we end up um, kind of getting um, the additive effect of both. And you can see this green version here. Now we're looking at buildings that, um, you know, for anywhere from the next 50 to 150 years have no carbon emissions associated with them. They're actually net uh, drawdown buildings, even when, when you include their operating emissions. Uh, wow. And so that's a pretty exciting place to get Right, and it's it 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 doesn't and, look uh, at buildings as climate change solutions because, mm -hmm. yeah, like we're, instead of doing less bad, like these the the red to the blue to the yellow is like we're doing less bad, and then the step to the green is hey we're actually doing more good, like we're actually reversing climate change with this building, not just making climate change a little bit less right know, bad than it than it's going to be. So, uh, you know, that, that kind Slowly of result I find pretty exciting yeah so instead of reducing our our impact on the climate uh uh on the climate we're actually able to reverse it with the green that's that's fascinating so uh let me move to the next slide because i uh i, I can't believe we've almost spent half an hour already it's just flown by there's so much meat uh uh on those uh slides that uh, we could spend even more time there um but but chris for the designers, the building designers, the the, the contractors uh, on today's uh, uh, webinar. What's the most important takeaways? What are the most important takeaways uh, uh, from all the work that you've done, the research you've done, the design work you've done? What are, what what are the key messages you want to take away? Want us to take away from today? Well, I guess one is that you know the people who have spent a lot of their time. Uh, figuring out how to make really energy efficient buildings have put us on a really great path. You know, this is in no way uh, a, a refuting that. Like, it's absolutely necessary to do that. And I think a lot of the approach and the tools that we figured out in the energy efficiency world will apply to the material emission world too. Like, energy models didn't exist 30 years ago, and now we have really great energy models, and we're sort of right at the start of also making material emission carbon models um, right. you know builders for climate action we're going to have a, a, a an emissions calculator available later this summer um, you guys have one in in your software the ec3 tool is out there uh, the athena institute has their uh, impact estimator so you know basically we need to take some lessons from from the passive house and energy efficiency world in that we need to model these things we need to set targets and then we need to learn how to, you know, find the materials and work with the materials and and actually assemble buildings that that get us to where the models tell us we need to be. 
Um, and I think that, you know, right now, the biggest hurdle is just understanding what materials have what impact associated with them. And it's just, you know, just now is that starting to become something that's pretty easy to do. Like for my study, I spent a year gathering all those environmental product declarations and and parsing the data in them and then translating that to amounts that would go into a building. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, there are calculators that do that. And, and sort of have all those EPDs in their database. Um, so what took a year, you know, to build our calculator for Builders for Climate Action, you can now get the results out of it in 20 minutes. <laughs> and so, right. Right. Um, so modeling and, and understanding, you know, the impacts of things, um, and the same approach, like I was saying, that that we've taken to energy efficiency, where you know, there we know that there's a whole bunch of places where we can intervene and that they all have different impacts and values and they all have different costs and implications and it becomes a, a, a matter of balancing out, you know, you know, do we spend the time and money on better thicker walls or better windows or both or neither, uh, you know, like, right. and, and the material emissions go the same way, you know, it's not you know people i think assume that i'm talking about buildings that are all made out of plants <laughs> yeah. but you know our buildings have steel roofs a lot of them have steel siding we have glass windows we have drywall like we do have materials that have emissions we just balance them out with materials that store and so you know it's it's achieving that same kind of balance that you do when you're thinking about the, the energy performance of a building it's like yeah. well i need to mix a little bit of this with a little bit of that and you know, if my target is this, I keep adjusting until I've hit my target, you know, in the same way I adjust my model so that it uses, you know, oh, I'm at 16 kilowatt hours per square meter. I need to tweak this and get it to 15. Great. Good. I did it. And yeah. and Good. so if we have the same the same targets for embodied carbon, then you're just doing a, another level of tweaking as you as you consider the, the design of the building. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very and, and, and very thoughtful. And I know. You know, I find people get involved with Passive House uh, uh, because they do care. Uh, yeah. They care about the climate. Um, and, uh, you know, they're out to build beautiful buildings, practical buildings, uh, but they care about the climate. And, and this, to me, I know more and more people I'm talking to in the, in the Passive House world are very concerned about that, that upfront uh, embodied carbon emissions and learning about how they can start measuring that as part of the passive house they want to build. So you've got a willing a, a willing audience here, I Absolutely, think. Absolutely, yeah. We'll continue to work together uh, to uh, to solve some of those uh, some of those practical issues. But you certainly have laid out a path forward. Moving, you know, if we if I think back to the slide, moving from the current red uh, to uh, to yellow and and maybe one day more and more of the green. Uh, you know, that's a, a fantastic pathway forward that doesn't appear anyway uh, to be too, too difficult, just requires a different way of thinking and a, a different way of planning. But um, let's take some time now because I've had an opportunity to ask you some questions. Let's take a time, uh, take some time and go to our audience to see if there are questions out there. Stephanie, do we have questions? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. The first one is concrete is so pervasive and such a major contributor to CO2 emissions, what can serve as a replacement scale to planetary production? Um, well, we just peeled the can, uh, the lid off the biggest can of worms probably <laughs> with concrete. So, you know, there there is that the whole concrete industry is very aware uh, of their role as, you know, one of the, the, the primary drivers of climate change in buildings. Um, and so there is a lot of work going on right now uh, to figure out how to reduce that. So I guess the, the solutions to me, there's, there are things in the immediate term. One is use less of it. You know, if you, can, if you can use less of the material, then there will be less emissions associated with it. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're designing for low embodied carbon, you know, it's probably going to look better to Put another story above ground than it is to try to build a basement uh, out of concrete in the ground. So, you know, design strategies that will minimize the concrete are great. Um, and then, and then, you know, there are some pretty straightforward ways that you can order your concrete 
um, with high either slag or fly ash, um, so high SCM concretes that do you know dramatically reduce the carbon footprint of the of the concrete by you know um, as much as 50 percent if you um, if you look at some of the environmental product declarations for really good concrete. Um, it has all the same properties. It's just as strong. It sets just as quickly, um, but just by by specking uh, a different mix, you can knock sort of 30 to 50 percent off your carbon footprint right there. So, in the near term, use less and use smart, good concrete uh, will make a big difference. And then, you know, there's all kinds of interesting stuff happening with uh, algal, like uh, algae-based concrete that actually grows, uh, microbe concrete that grows. Um, people doing really great work with um, different uh, categories of of SCMs that um, that don't rely on the steel or coal industry for for the raw material. Um, it's a it's a fascinating world. Like we're we're sort of right at the at the at the tip of of really cool things happening in the world of concrete. But most of it is not stuff that you or I are going to be able to put into a building this year or next year. Um, so in the meantime, you know, just thinking about about reducing concrete and using uh, the lowest possible carbon footprint concrete is are the the two things to to take away. Great. Okay, we have another question. How does material durability affect carbon emissions and storage? Well, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm guessing that the that the implication in that question is that the the carbon storing materials are possibly less durable than than their higher carbon um, alternatives, and if that's the case, I sort of have two two ways to think about that. One is um, to question the assumption that the carbon storing materials, because they're plant based, um, have shorter lifespans necessarily. In the in the North American low rise building sector, are building wood frame buildings. Um, that's a plant-based material, and we plan on those buildings lasting, you know, anywhere from 50 to 200 years, depending on uh, our intentions. And I would say that in any anybody who feels like they can build a wood frame building that will last that long can use other plant-based materials uh, in and attached to that wood frame, and those materials will last just as long. You know, I've toured the original straw bale houses of Nebraska that are uh, built in the late 1800s, early 1900s low-tech pioneer building still occupied today straw still looks great in those walls so you know if, if we're if we're smart good builders and we feel like we can build with wood then we can build with lots of other plant materials and and that'll be successful um, but you know that the lifespan of the materials does matter but maybe not as much as we think in terms of our our um, what we need to do for climate change right now you know, by the IPC's estimations, we only have about 30 years to really, you know, make a difference here. So if we're going to debate that a material that needs to be swapped out in 70 years, again, um, might ha end up having a higher carbon footprint at the 140 year mark than the one that made it the whole 140 years, that's a great debate to have. But But if we make a bunch of emissions, <laughs> To make that 140 year mark now, we may not care that much in 140 years if if it if it won the contest. Like we're we're we really need to reduce emissions so dramatically. Like it's it's hard to emphasize how quickly it needs to go down. That you know if if we're building things that that will last the 50 years, if we want to make that our window for dealing with climate change. Um, that's what we need to do, and you know uh, the fact that at the end of a very long life cycle, you know a material might actually, in theory, have a lesser you know carbon impact. It, it, the theory is going to remain theory if we don't have a climate uh, for that building to to be within. So, um, right. and that's not you know I'm not tossing that out lightly. Like we should have no regard for the future, but I think the regard we should have for the future is the sort of um, knowable future that we can um, make an impact on and sort of predict and you know um, all the materials that I'm suggesting in this report or have included in this report there's nothing in there that doesn't last 50 to 100 to beyond um, 
Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, the, the, the suggestion isn't to make short-term throwaway buildings because they have low carbon. It's to make equivalent buildings that have, you know, uh, half a century to a century of, of, of reasonable lifespan um, and try to save the climate while doing that. <laughs> Right. Okay, great. And there's one, I'll do one more question and hopefully it's a quick one. Are there plans to include existing buildings in comparative studies? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just working on a, a project with the city of Toronto right now, looking at, at, at this same notion, but when it comes to renovations and, you know, in, in a lot of ways the the embodied carbon impact is in some ways even greater for renovations because all you're adding typically are are insulation and maybe windows, mm -hmm. and so. But you're you're maybe not having as big an impact unless you're you're actually doing a a passive house level retrofit. So if you expend, you know, if you blast an old house full of spray foam and you improve its energy efficiency by 25 percent, but you cause this huge spike of emissions to do that, the the payback time may actually be, or you know, in the study we're doing, looks to be you know, even longer than it is for for using those same materials in a in a new build. Um, so I think, um, but the beauty of an existing building is, you know, there are no anything that you don't replace. There are no emissions associated with leaving that material there. Um, you know, it already had its climate impact when that building was built. So the more we can leave it, um, the 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 less. Um, the less climate change we're going to cause now. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, yeah, good, 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 good questions and, and good answers. And I yeah, know I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at a list of uh, there's many, many, many questions here, but we're simply running out of time. Um, but it sounds to me, uh, Chris, that that you know, um, uh, one of the things that frustrates me uh, coming from the passive house world uh, is that uh, what seems to be driving so much is simply uh, lower uh, energy usage, low energy, low energy, net zero, and that's the only thing that seems to count. Uh, when in fact, from a passive house perspective, we're saying, hold on, there's all sorts of other things that we need to 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 bring to the table, not just low energy, uh, because passive house, for example, uh, does a lot more than low energy. You know, these are very resilient buildings. These are very healthy buildings, comfortable buildings. A whole bunch of other things that make these help make these buildings uh, sustainable. But one thing that's missing that that we have to start including, and and uh, you know, our commitment is to start is to continue and and ramp it up. We also need to think about that that upfront uh, embodied carbon emissions and and work through the formula. That you've laid out in the, uh, uh, the the study that we've attached to today's presentation, you know the upfront embodied carbon emissions plus the the operational carbon emissions give us that carbon use intensity, and that's something that I think we at Passive House, the designers, the builders, uh, need to get a handle on because, as you so rightly pointed out, all the good that that a Passive House uh, new building or inner fit uh, retrofit could do all the good it could do for the environment for the climate crisis uh, could be lost if we pick the wrong materials am i am i correct in saying that yeah absolutely i mean that's certainly my study and, and every, that's kind of the result that everybody who's looking yeah. into this is is coming to and i think you know one thing that i that i would want to add because we didn't really get into it is that okay. those same stack benefits that you're talking about with passive houses Right. All of these sort of bio-based building materials add to those stack benefits. Like they also tend to have less red list or, or sort of questionable chemical content. So if you're looking for a healthier building, they add to a healthier building. They We use them in uh, vapor open wall and roof assemblies, which adds resilience to the building and, and adds to uh, you know that the, it's it's sort of moisture handling capability and its its ability to dry in both directions. Like, so it's not. I think yeah, we have to be very careful. Human beings make bad mistakes when we only focus on one metric. You know, and, and right. if the metric is just energy use, you're probably going to overlook a bunch of things. But if it's energy use, carbon footprint, occupant health, building durability, if you start adding all of that together, it's like now you're getting to a solution. Uh, now we're getting yeah now we're getting to the unifying theory of building exactly uh, yeah <laughs> which 
which is which is what what I think we're all striving from. We're all coming from different directions, whether you're purely in it for low energy or passive house, a bunch of other uh, important reasons, or uh, you know the, uh, the 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 carbon use intensity. But I think you lay out in your uh, in your research uh, how important uh, to look at the the carbon use intensity is. So that's the big takeaway for me today, and it's it's been a good education. Uh, reading uh, your report, and I know we'll we'll be working with you in the future as uh, as we work to educate uh, uh, builders and designers right across the country. So so thanks, Chris, for the work that you're doing, uh, the work that the Endeavor Center is doing, and 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 for your time today to educate us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to to share with the passive house crowd. Good, thanks. Well, we can turn off our cameras now, Chris, because I've okay. got a couple of slides left, uh, and I will uh, move quickly to those. And I'll let people know that uh, uh, that what we're doing here in uh, uh, at Passive House Canada. And I now think that, given my conversation with Chris, I, I we have to change the title, perhaps. But uh, we're trying to put talk into action, and so we're offering a course. It's our 310 course how to identify and drive down embodied carbon in buildings. Um, we're launching this uh, at the end of July. Uh, it's a two hour webinar uh, by one of our uh, esteemed instructor, uh, instructors, uh, Philippe Saint-Jean, who is, is an incredibly talented individual uh, and has, uh, has taken all that he knows about, uh, about that upfront embodied carbon emissions and has developed a way of plugging that into passive house design. So if you are interested in this uh, topic when it comes to a passive house perspective, uh, join us July 30th and uh, we'll kick this series off. So uh, that's what we're doing, uh, we're doing then. And moving along, uh, the, as I said, this, is, uh, this has been uh, Carbon Month at uh, Building Conversations. Uh, our next session, June the 24th, is with Kathy Wardell. Uh, she's the Director of Sustainability. Uh, she's an Associate Principal at Perkins and Will. Um, she's going to talk to us about carbon impact statements that this is something that Perkins and Will is developing uh, for all of their firm's new projects. Um, these are assessments that, go, that are going to document each project's operational and uh, embodied carbon. Uh, footprint. So that will be interesting. Uh, that'll be an interesting conversation with Kathy. So I want to leave it there. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, and thank you to, uh, to Chris uh, Magwood for his time, his expertise. Uh, Passive House Canada is certainly indebted to uh, uh, the work that he is doing, the research work is he, he's doing. It's educating all of us. Thank you again for being online. And we'll leave it there. Have a safe week. Uh, join us next week for another in our, our carbon series at Building Conversations. I'm Chris Ballard, the CEO of Passive House Canada. Have a good week. <laughs>